Li Bai, leaving early from White Emperor's city. We left White Emperor among dawn reddened clouds. A thousand miles to Yang Ling, crossed in a day. From both riverbanks, the constant shriek of gibbons. Already our small boat has passed a thousand serried mountains. So this is the second of the um, heptasyllabic quatrains by Libai that is included in this anthology. And I believe this poem is pretty well known as well. It's one of the, the popular pieces of Libai. Uh, perhaps less known than the one we talked about yesterday. I've also found it less moving. Um, probably perhaps because the you know, translation uh, tends to favor poems that have very rich imagery or very... Um, or very conceptual literary tropes that de that that you know survive well in translation, whereas others don't. Anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit about this poem. First, a little bit of historical context. I believe this poem was written in the aftermath of the Al Shan Rebellion, probably in the late seven fifties. Now, at that time, Li Bai had spent most of his time basically in the southeastern part of China, in the, the Jiangsu River area, in Yangling specifically, he had lived for a time. And uh, he got embroiled in the, in the chaotic situation that, uh, that, that, that followed after the rebellion within the imperial family, like the emperor abdicated and uh, ran away to Shu. His main son and heir remained in the northwest and in a year or so managed to recover the capital. But there were other pretenders of the of the Li imperial clan in the south. One of them practically tried to stage a, 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 a coup, or, a, or at least showed interest in 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 getting to to power. Uh, he was defeated, and uh, Levi was in his interage, which means that Levi was um, punished. Uh, he was sentenced, at the very least, to exile, if not to something worse. Uh, so, so this poem actually, and, and the White Emperor City that is mentioned in the title, refers to the place where Li Bai was stopping in his way to a far away remote exile when news came of an imperial pardon, which meant that he could leave by the Cheng, the White Emperor City, and go back to Jiangling. So, so the background of this poem is returning home after being exiled because of some accidents. So the topic of the poem is travel. The explicit topic of the poem is traveling, more specifically returning home. Well, I mean, Yan Ling wasn't the birthplace of 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 Li Bai, but he had spent some time there, and he would have felt when writing this poem that it was a home of sorts to him. Anyway, more home than any remote exile place to which he was going. You could say there is a a landscape element on it. It's a quatrain, so you, you don't have much space to describe nature. But there are, especially in the, in the, yeah, you have sh small images that do describe the landscape and the surroundings, both of the White Emperor City and of the river route down from it to Yangling. And of course, the the, the oblique or the underlying current, the underlying topic would be the gladness, the happiness of Li Bai at not having to continue into exile. So first let's talk a little bit about White Emperor City by Di Cheng. This was a city that was located in the very upper uh, course of the Jiangsu River, so probably quite close to Shu. And it's pretty close to modern-day uh, Chongqing, again in, in the west, into the, to, the, to the three gorges and the dams that have been built in the upper course of the Jiangsu River. So it was quite an elevated position, very close to the Tibetan plateau. Uh, it was located in a high place. The name of the city, Bai Di Cheng, is not at all clear. Uh, I've read different different interpretations. One of them says that in this misty area, where, with the white mist surrounding the highly placed, uh, the highly located city, you know, one gets the impression of of, of being in in a, surrounded by a preternatural, divine, white presence. Remember, Di in Chinese, although it's used for emperor in the compound Huang Di, in its origin meant just divinity, God. So it could be white god city. And white being associated also with the, with the, the west, it's the symbol of the west, the color of the west. 
in other stories, uh, the name of the city is uh, associated with uh, one of the usurpers, one of the candidates for the imperial throne during the fall of Wang Mang and the, the beginning of the Eastern Han Dynasty, when a person who controlled this area of the West of Shu proclaimed himself uh, the White Emperor after some people had seen or had seen dreams of a big white dragon or something like that. And this uh, pretender would have founded White Emperor City and given it his name. But anyway, regardless, the only thing we have to stick with is that White Emperor City is quite a, a quaint, beautiful uh, town, very high on, on, on a high landscape <coughs> and on the upper course of the Yangtze River. So... Levi is leaving early. He wants to get as far away from the place as possible and return to his home as soon as possible after receiving news of the imperial pardon. Let's, like, uh, let's take a look at the poem couplet by couplet, as we usually do. First couplet. We left white emperor among dawn-reddened clouds. A thousand miles to Jiangling crossed in a day. So as usual, the first couplet of a, a quatrain is pretty narrative and um, pretty background giving and objective. You know, in this couplet, we summarize the whole story and the whole, well, most of the background of the poem. Uh, we have the chronotope. We have what time? Early morning. And this early morning is evoked through dawn reddened clouds. You know, there's always a lovely image, this rosy colored morning scene when the sun rises. You know, it's always a quaint, conventional, but beautiful image of, of morning. So that's the time. Where were we in White Emperor City? Where are we going to? Yangling City. Now, Yangling is in the middle reaches of the Jiangsu River, which is a hell of a distance. But uh, traveling by water, traveling by boat, it's pretty fast. It was the fastest means of locomotion before the Industrial Revolution. And we also have to mention that uh, this, this course going down is following... Uh, the course of the natural course of the river, which mm, goes towards the East China Sea, and uh, it's down. So, so it would have been a pretty fast trip. Mm, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, Levi is being hyperbolic in saying that it's a thousand miles and that it only took a day to cross it, maybe twenty-four hours. But maybe you know, I, I, I am not aware, but maybe this is realistic. If it were, it denotes crossing an enormous distance in very small time, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know the exact kilometers from Bai Di Cheng to Jiangling, but I'm probably, it's probably no less than from, I don't know, from Madrid to Paris, I imagine. So, so n definitely not the sort of thing which in a pre-industrial age, the sort of distance that in a pre-industrial age could be covered in a day, except when exceptional circumstances like this, um, joined together, like a, a fast-flowing, down-flowing river coming from a very high place. So that's the story. We mm, left in the morning, we went from Bai Di Cheng, and in one day, 24 hours, down through the river, we reached Xiangling. Now, this fastness in reaching is probably meant to be propitious as well, like... Uh, in, uh, Liba is meant to be enthusiastic because he's returning home, but he's also enthusiastic because he's returning from exile. So, so probably this speed, the emphasizing of this speed, is also meant to connote the 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 the, 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 the impatience, the the eagerness, the speed with which uh, mm, Liba's feelings propel him towards the town that he is going towards. So. In a metaphorical way, his mind is also pushing the boat to arrive quickly to Yangling. Second couplet. Uh, from both riverbanks, the constant shriek of gibbons. Already our small boat has passed the thousand serried mountains. So the second couplet, um, not, it's not explicitly uh, subjective. It's more descriptive. And what we ha get here is what was seen from the boat while the boat was flashing by so quickly like an arrow down the river. And we get two, two elements, two, two background uh, landscape effects. One of them is oral, the other is visual, which is a very typical combination. So from both riverbanks going down, the constant shrieks of gibbons. Now, gibbons shrieking were a conventional image of the, 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 the remote areas in the rivers of the south and the forests in the south. 
It was meant to be a melancholy sound associated with autumn, and it's meant to be nature's resounding sadness, which generally matches a poet who is a traveller feeling sad and going home. Sorry, going far from home. But here, you know, it, it feels a bit weird. Maybe it's a, an element of local exoticity and colour. But uh, in this case, at least, there's no correlation between the crying of the gibbons and uh, the crying of Levi, because he's, he's not sad at all. He's not crying. He's rather glad. But maybe it's an ambient background. It's the adequate and expected background of going down the Jiangsu River Valley. And already our small boat has passed a thousand serried mountains. This is also a conventional view um, in, of the Jiangsu River Valley, especially in some areas. The shores, both shores are full of mountains. In some areas they're more visible than others. They form like these huge towers and... Uh, and, then, and, then, and, with, with, and they have this saw teeth shape, like they're mountains piled upon mountains, uh, forming like these serried ranks. And uh, this appears a lot in very classical Chinese paintings. Like you have the river and you have the high mountains just next to the river and overshadowing it. So that's what, what was seen. So we heard the gibbons and we saw these mountains piling upon each other. So typical sad travelers' images, but they are not imbued, I think, with any sadness or melancholy in the second couplet because we're not meant to, to read this as, as melancholy. Maybe they just have this landscapey descriptive element that's showing the, the, the melancholy sights and sounds and, and awesome and impressive sights and sounds of the South as um, Libai goes from one place to another within that self, same south. So, okay, it's, it's an okay poem. I've read other poems by Libai that I found more moving, but it's okay. 